you can talk most people into cuffs unless they have nothing to lose. Even those people, I would say 99% of them, they just want to get away. Hey there, you're listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 718 with my guest today, David Leith. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show, founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to see everything we do, visit whistlekick.com. That's our digital hub. It's the place to find our store. And if you use the code PODCAST15, you're going to save 15% on anything that you find over there, from training equipment to apparel, you name it, it works. Martial Arts Radio, the show, gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We release two brand new shows each and every week. We've been doing that for years. Why? Well, it's under the heading of connecting, educating, and entertaining traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to help the show and the work that we do, you can do a number of things. You could make a purchase, maybe tell a friend, maybe grab a book on Amazon, or you could join the Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. It's a place where we post exclusive content. We give bonus merch. We give you behind the scenes information and you can get started for as little as $2 a month. Yep, there's no commitment and cancel anytime. But if you want the full list, all the ways that you can help from the paid to the free, the simple to the more complicated, as well as maybe some other kind of fun stuff that we drop in there, whistlekick.com slash family. It's a special page that we set up for those of you who are willing to put in the work, so much work, of typing in whistlekick.com slash family. There's a lot there. We update it. I update it personally at least once a week. So maybe you want to check that out. David Leith is a fellow podcaster, martial arts enthusiast, who, unlike a lot of us, has used his martial arts day-to-day in his profession to, let's call a spade a spade, stay alive. I had a fun conversation with him. I enjoyed it. And I think you will too. Good morning, David. How are you? Good morning. I have a microphone and uh, okay. I'm going to plug it in also. Sure. Sounds good. So you have, par- you have partners? Uh, there are people who work on the show. You know, Andrew, oh. who you've been communicating with, he yeah. he's a big part of the show. Julius has been with me. I think we're coming up on five years. That's incredible. On the back end of the show. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a lot of work. Well, we do two a week. So that's awesome, recording man. with you and two other people today. Yeah. 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 And you schedule them so far out. Yeah. I was worried because I'm like, I don't know if they remembered. <laughs> oh, we remember. We remember. Yeah. I didn't hear from you. Um, you said you, you'd like messaged me like a week prior or something like that in the last email. Maybe that oh, was apolo- apologies. That, that's apologies. okay. It's, um, it's all good. Yeah, we just had the biggest event we've probably ever done this past weekend. And so we had a bunch of prep. So um, what was the event? We we did a destination training here in Vermont, all inclusive, where the training itself was. It all built on on everything else. So we started Friday night and we ended Sunday morning and we just kept stacking and tweaking and it took Andrew, Andrew and I worked on this for, for over six months, putting this was together. The, was the training uh, martial arts related? Yeah. Or, uh, okay. Yeah, it was martial arts training. and um, They're all fighting among themselves now. Who's going to sign up first for next year already? That's awesome. So, when we open so the, do you guys have there. a school? Nope. No, he does. He does. Okay. I'm, I'm looking at opening one, but no, this is, at least for now, what I do, this is what I do. This is, this is my martial arts school. Okay. All right. Awesome. Yeah. I, uh, I think I mentioned, but I've been a fan. Uh, are we, are we live now? Not if we don't want to be the recording is running, but we can, you know, jot down a start time whenever we want. Uh, it, live or pre show. It's all the same. I, That's right. You, know, you, you get the same me. So anyway, <laughs> uh, I, I've been a fan of martial arts since I was, probably as young as I can remember, um, watching Batman, uh, watching Bruce Lee, you know? So which uh, Batman are we talking about? Like Adam West Batman? Adam West. Okay. We're going back there with, yeah, yeah. I remember that show, man. That was a good show. Yeah. Yeah. I used to rush home, rush home and just watch, you know, 
with yeah. eyes wide open, you know, and just, <laughs> it, I used to just love it. It was so corny. <laughs> like looking back now, it's like so corny, but it was perfect for little kids. You know? Absolutely. And instead of the the real violence, you know, the, yep. the cartoon graphics come up, bam, you know, and you kind of fill in the gaps. Yeah. 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 I like it. And then, um, and then as I got a little older, the Saturday morning Kung Fu, like I, w- I would just watch so much television when I was younger. It was, it was my babysitter. <laughs> sure. You're not alone so, in that. Uh, so the Saturday morning Kung Fu flicks, like I grew up on those. Mm. I don't know if it was Saturday mornings or Sunday mornings, but they would be on, I know they would be on channel 11. And, uh, my, it was my older brother that got me into him because he'd be like lip syncing and like making, you know, like pretending to do the moves. He'd be like, you know, yep. Yep. <laughs> and uh, I grew up on the Wu-Tang Clan and yeah. the fist, the fist of the white Lotus and the drunken, the drunken monk. So uh, as long as I can remember. Oh, and then he, my older brother also got a hold of Kung Fu magazine mm. and uh Every now and then he'd order something like I'd there'd be nunchucks in the house, <laughs> you know, like it was uh it was the eighties. So that was, yeah. you know, that was the thing. Like you'd order things through the mail. Uh, you could get, I remember getting stars through I no, mm-hmm. no martial arts training whatsoever, <laughs> but I got Kung Fu stars through the mail yeah. and uh, I would throw them at my back fence. You know, I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> and they did not stick in nearly as well as you expected them to, did they? No, no, no. But you know, I still, I think I have these metal stars somewhere and I, I don't know why I have them, but you know, it's not like I'm ever going to be throwing them, <laughs> but somewhere in me, there is a ninja. Like I studied jujitsu, but somewhere yeah. in me, there is ninjutsu. <laughs> yeah. Everybody wanted to be a ninja in the eighties. I mean, yeah. what, what was cooler than, you know, you probably had the same thing I, I did, you know, looking at the back of those magazines and looking at all the different ninja stuff. It's like, Oh, apparently I need boots yeah. with, with a split in the toes. Cause somehow that's what ninjas do. And I need the black mask. And I need the black clothes and running around in the backyard, all decked out in black and being a ninja, sweating to death in the middle of summer. I saw a woman in the airport. Uh, I just came back from Florida with my girlfriend and uh, she had the split toe boots and Ooh. her style, just her, her whole st- her whole color scheme was gray. And I'm like, she must be European because nobody wears those type of boots anymore. <laughs> you didn't ask her if she was a ninja. No, I didn't ask if she was a ninja, but you just made me, you just reminded me about those, those boots. And uh, you also needed the claw because I, uh, because I I thought I was going to climb trees. Because we, because every ninja, (laughs) every aspiring ninja in the eighties needed to be ready to climb any tree at any given time. And because somehow that's where all the action was, was in the scale scale a tree and scale the side of a house scale scale side of uh you know somebody's home and be able to <laughs> crawl through if you needed to <laughs> these are things that we thought were were a big deal it actually it reminds me um there's a meme that i see go around once in a while on social media and and the premise is you know as a kid i really thought quicksand was going to be a much bigger deal in my adult life than it is now Right. Like think of all these things that we thought were a big deal when we were kids. You know, we thought ninjas were all over the place and we were going to be ninjas. And And the other thing, the other thing when uh, people join martial arts is they think that there's going to be a fight some at some point. And and some people do. But most martial artists, once they learn how to fight, they never really have to fight because uh, I just like, listen, I I don't need to fight you. (laughs) Right. <laughs> I don't need to prove how tough I am. You know, like it's, it's self-defense in case you're cornered. It's not like self-offense, you know, like you don't go out. Mm. And, and the other thing that I've noticed about um, a lot, like I've spent a lot of time, I would say probably a decade in, in different gyms, dojos, you know, and my first style was Kempo, uh, Kempo Karate. I did that for two years and uh, we sparred a lot. So there was like a lot of, a lot of ego, a lot of tough guys, mm. but I, I loved it. 
I loved it. And that was um, before I joined the police department. So uh, I was doing that, but then I was doing the katas and I hate, absolutely hated katas. So no disrespect if you do katas. <laughs> what's, what's your style? I, I do a lot of different things and I definitely do kata. You definitely do kata. Okay. So, so like when I was doing kata, they would like, at first I enjoyed it. And then like, I got to the point where I was bored with it and I was just like, oh my God, how many more times am I going to go like this, go like this, <laughs> <laughs> go like this, go like this. And it, and it just got to the point where, um, and this was around the early nineties when, um, the UFC had just come out and I saw, uh, so I'm training in Kempo. I'm throwing a lot of kicks. Uh, we also did, uh, I did Taekwondo as well. I, I really am a true, true lover of like all martial arts. Yeah. Sounds and uh, they came out with the early nineties, the early UFC, and it was going to be style versus style. And then I saw this uh, skinny guy, Hoist Gracie, <laughs> uh, tapping out, these wrestlers that were a hundred pounds heavier than him. Right. And uh, like my eyes, I, I was like a kid again, you know, I was like, what style is that? You know? And uh, as soon as I could, I found a jujitsu school. And my first question was like, is there katas in jujitsu? <laughs> and, and my instructor was like, no, we don't have katas. And I'm like, and do you do Brazilian jujitsu? And he's like, yes, we do. <laughs> so it's a Japanese, it was a Japanese jujitsu school. Um, but he had a couple of nights a week. He, he was a lover of jujitsu also. So mm. like we used to watch the UFCs together. Nice. Um, my instructor was like uh, a big brother slash you know, Frank, he was only three years older than me, but he had been training since he was 16 in jujitsu. So he was, by the time I met him, he was like a third or fourth degree black belt. You know, he'd been doing it for a long, long time. And, uh, I, I fell in love with jujitsu until my body felt like it was broken. You know, <laughs> <laughs> how long did that take? Um, I would say like, I was, so I was rolling in my twenties and, um, I would say until I was like, uh, 27, about seven years. So I would say just before I reached 30, um, I had been training for a good seven years. I would say in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I was probably a, um, high level blue belt, may maybe a low level purple belt. Um, I, cause I was tapping guys that were at that level and, um, and then one time in practice, like I, I would be rolling with people who, um, uh, were inexperienced or a lot heavier than me. Mm -hmm. And, um, this one guy dropped the elbow on my face mm -hmm. and, and I ended up needing to go to the hospital and get stitches from my face. And I was like, what the hell am I doing? I'm like, I'm not a professional fighter. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm training just because I love it. And, but slowly the love of, uh, of jujitsu, I, I still absolutely love jujitsu. I watch a lot of videos and, um, my girlfriend's kids, they go to MMA class now. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's really cute. And, uh, how old are the kids? They're uh, 10 and seven. And the seven-year-old girl, she wants to do a competition that's coming up next week. And the 10-year-old boy feels like he's not ready. He's scared. And he's like, I don't want to do it. And I told her, I'm like, listen, don't push him into the tournament. Um, if, he, if he feels like uh, he's not ready, I'm like, there's plenty of time for him to compete in the next one to two years when he's in middle school. If he feels like he's ready, yeah. he'll ask you to do to do it, you know? Um, if he feels like he's right, not ready, don't make him do it. And cause that's my philosophy with my, um, I have three sons myself and all three of them wrestled from the time they were in, uh, elementary school all the way to high school. And I told them, I'm like, you can't quit wrestling until you can beat dad. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. And even, 
Even in high school, they couldn't beat me. My youngest one is a beast, though. He uh, won the counties and uh, almost went to the states. But uh, we we live in a. Are you? What state are you in? I'm in Vermont. Yeah. So that's the question. Are you somewhere where wrestling's a real big deal? Huge. I'm on Long Island, New York. Okay. And uh, in my my county, uh, we send a lot of guys up to the states. Mm. Yeah, my county sends. Oh, they always send like three to four people. And sometimes it's a wild card person uh, like that should have won the counties. But like, so anyway, we send a lot of people up to the States and it's a big, big deal in this county. Yeah. Um, so when they were in elementary, when they were in elementary school, I would ask them, hey, do you want to do this tournament coming up? And if they said no, I, I wouldn't push the issue i would just mm-hmm. um and then once they got into uh middle school i started taking them more regularly and taking them to additional like camps and trainings and things and uh the two older ones once they got to high school they said they didn't want to do it anymore and it, like my heart was broken because i i've loved wrestling you know um just watching my sons compete i absolutely right. love being in the stands and i and i spent a lot of hours in the stands and watching them so uh and just being a fan and cheering them on and when they said they didn't want to do it anymore it like it crushed my soul and my heart but i'm like all right you've been wrestling your whole life you don't want to do it you know it was an argument (laughs) it was definitely an argument sure uh my oldest son was rebellious he was just like uh flat out quit my youngest son went to one more season, but then he told his coaches, I'm only here because my parents are making me do this. Mm. So they sat him out and they, you know, they, the coaches actually had a talk with me and my wife and they were like, listen, uh, this is a really tough sport if your heart's not in it. You know, it's like the most challenging. Did you ever wrestle? No, but I, I've, I've known enough wrestlers in my adult life. I, I, I think I suspect what you're going to say. It, it's yeah. brutal. It is brutal if your heart's not in it. It's brutal if your heart's in it, first right. of all. So, um, and then if your heart's not in it, it's even, you know, more brutal. Yeah. Um, and my middle son was so athletically gifted. Like, you know, when you see somebody who's just athletically gifted and they're like, oh my God, you have so much talent. You could be so good. And it was just not in his, his heart. He's like, this yeah. is something that you want from me. It's not something I want. It was, you know. That, what did, what did he want? Did he want something else? He didn't. He didn't. He wanted to not do sports. Oh. <laughs> and I was like, well, you can't. You can't not do anything. You know, yeah. but you have to do something. And uh, because his brother is old, the oldest one, the oldest son. Uh, once he stopped wrestling, he started getting into trouble in school and getting into trouble with his friends. So I was just like, that was my parent parent equation. Like, hey, if you're not doing sports, you're going to get into trouble. You know, yeah. uh, Chris Rock, he has a joke where he says, uh, uh, parents' only job is to keep the daughter off the pole and their son's out of jail. <laughs> <laughs> so I always believe that uh, my only job was to keep my sons out of trouble and out of jail. You know, uh, thank God, knock on wood, they never went to jail. But um, I, I still believe to this day, you have to keep them involved in something. Yeah. Um, so I, I want I want to go back. I want to go yeah. back because we yeah. there, you hit a couple things that I want to yeah. I want to pull some threads on. And yeah, the first I know. one I've being been, been rambling. <laughs> that, that, that's that's your job. My yeah. job is to keep you talking, and you're making my job really easy, which I appreciate. Thank you. Thank you. So here we are. We're in the we're in the eighties, and you're Kung watching Fu. Kung Fu theater, <laughs> and you know you're ordering throwing stars. Somehow that transitions to you starting formal training with Kempo. I've always at I've that always, age there would have been parental involvement. Um, no, right? I was, no, for you, I, I was about. So I, I've worked since I was I want to say okay. 15, 15. <laughs> okay, and uh, raised by a single mom. And I've worked since I was about fifteen. I had my first job on a on a farm. 
And then I worked at a deli. And then at uh, 15, I worked for McDonald's. So I've always, every mm. summer, uh, I've earned money. And then at 16, I joined uh, the football team and they had hell week. And uh, I determined that I didn't want it to go through hell. <laughs> and Your I heart wasn't in it. My heart was not in football. But then in the 10th grade, I joined the uh, wrestling team mm. and I absolutely loved it. I loved practicing. Um, but I, but because I had a single mom who uh, she didn't really provide, she didn't make a lot of money. So sure. um, it was like, Hey, do I want to wrestle or do I want to earn money? So like I said, I'd always worked. So I got a factory job and um from 16 to 20, I had worked at that same factory. It was really great for a teenager because you could call in the day of and say that you didn't want to go to work and they wouldn't fire you. Like as long as you didn't abuse it, but you mm. could call in the day of and say, yeah, I'm not, as long as you gave them enough notice, they could, uh, you know, they always somebody had, else. have somebody else fill in your spot. Cause it was basically like an assembly line, uh, Estee Lauder Whitman packaging oh, yeah. where you sit on the lot, you sit on the line and you put the, uh, makeup on the line the, or the makeup in the box. Yeah. It was perfect work for a teenager. <laughs> Not much thought to it. You just had to like reach in one box, put your stuff in the next box. And then you got little breaks here and there. So that was my, um, that was my job until I got a career with the police department. Okay. Um, I, like I said, I, I had that job for about four years and then I started as a civilian with the police department and uh, I was making pretty good money as a uh, college student working for the police department as a clerk, as, as a civilian clerk. And um, one of the officers there, he said, oh, my, my kids, they go to this school, um, you know, this local school. Uh, the uh, instructor, the sensei, he's really good. You should, uh, and, and he's, a, uh, he's a correction officer. So like my eyes lit up at that, you know, cause mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask him all these stories about, you know, like, like I had no idea what the job was like, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, I knew I didn't want to be corrections. <laughs> yeah, I knew, I but knew. But you knew those guys had stories. Yeah. Corrections officers had, always have they stories. They definitely had stories. So we've had some of those me, on the show. He would tell me about, you know, like if a prisoner was walking by, he'd have his back to the wall so that he could, and he'd always be watching their hands because, uh, you know, a couple of them tried to shank him. So like his knife defense, like was really, really good. And, um, and I just like, anytime he spoke, my eyes were wide open, you know, and, uh, like that was my first, first, like love for another man instructor, you know, mm. like he was so, so macho, so manly, uh, Tony Orsano. Uh, he's still alive. If he, I doubt he'll ever hear this, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, um, he was like, like, I don't, I don't know if you've, I'm sure a lot of your listeners can relate to this. Like when you go into a school and the instructor is like up on a pedestal mm -hmm. and like, you think they're, um, and he still, he still is this amazing human being, but like he was, it was my first martial arts experience. And, um, like if he told me, Hey, go punch that wall for an hour, I would have went and punched the wall for an hour. Like if he, if he told you, you, you understand what I'm saying? I totally get what you're saying. So, um, we did a lot of sparring and, and I loved it. The things that I loved about Kempo and karate was the sparring and the, uh, the distance control and the timing, the time, I would say the timing of it is key. Mm -hmm. That's what I loved about karate. What I did not love was that, so I, to rewind a little bit, my best okay. friend was a state wrestler, um, state champion wrestler. And uh, that's what made me join wrestling in the 10th grade. Okay. So when I joined in the 10th grade, I quickly realized that these other kids had been training for you know like years ahead of me and i was like really far behind in my <laughs> athletic development 
and uh, and my knowledge of the sport. So I sucked at wrestling, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so like, but I love being in the training room. I loved the practices. I, I just loved getting my hands on people. I, I, my soul loved wrestling and, and, mm. and I had been wrestling with my neighbor, you know, like in the backyard or in his basement for my uh, entire, you know, kid life he, he sure. would ragdoll me and before i knew what the guard did you do any jujitsu at all yeah a little bit yeah okay so you know what i'm talking about then so before i knew what the guard was um he'd get me on my back and i'd throw my legs up around his rib cage and i would try to crush his ribs with, with my legs <laughs> that was the extent of my of my uh like and i would try and just hold that position and i didn't know what it was called i didn't know what it was but mm -hmm. that's all that i could do against him because he was such a dominant wrestler mm -hmm. like he would take me down so easy so when i was training in uh kempo karate the one thing that I didn't love was that my instructor never, ever, ever touched on if someone comes after your legs, if like how to defend against wrestlers. And I would bring those things up because like I grew up with a wrestler and and uh, like all of the techniques were all uh, standing, uh, striking mm -hmm. based and and. and uh, and this was before the UFC. So I was thinking like, like, hey, well, what, what happens if the guy comes in on a single and he grabs your leg? Or what happens if he tries to, you know, do a double? And like, mm -hmm. and one of my sparring partners, this guy, Gene, he used to be a wrestler. So like when we'd spar, I could have these conversations with him. But when I had those conversations with my, um, with my sensei, um, he, he'd always be like, oh, well, why do you want to go down to the ground? <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm not saying I want to. I'm just saying, well, what happens if it ends up there? Like, what happens if, you know, like, what if what if they do this? What if they do that? You know, and uh, he just wouldn't hear it. So mm. so like that was that was where, like, I started and, and my my uh disdain for kata like i told you <laughs> my disdain for katas but you know i i, got, I gotta say because i had this vision of you on the on the, the factory line just like taking things out of boxes putting them putting them in and like getting better and getting more efficient i'm like man that's kata right there yeah yeah you're just yeah. getting better at a, at a a simple process and the quote, taking the benefit from it. The quote, uh, I believe it's Bruce Lee, is uh, "Fear the man that practices the same kick ten thousand times." Yeah, not not the man that does ten thousand techniques, right, but right. the same kick. Um, so I understand that concept a uh, hundred percent because uh, when I went to jujitsu, a lot of times uh, there was a lot of young guys in their twenties that would want to go live. And I'm like, and, and I'd be sore. So I'd be like, Hey, let's just drill this one technique today. Let's just drill this. Like, and people, and, and I was like that. I did have that kind of a, uh, a mindset of let's do this a hundred times today, you know, and people would get sick of it. And I'd be like, let me just get behind you. And, and pull this around your neck you know? <laughs> as many times as you can, you know, as many times as you can possibly stand. And um, at where the good birth, stuff comes from. Yeah, 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 yeah. The basics. And I remember my jujitsu instructor saying that um, you know the best jujitsu practitioners um, they just practice the basics over and over and over and over and over again. And my uh, Kempo instructor said the same thing. He's like, you want to get good, throw this front kick over and over and over again. And uh, I still have a really good side kick. I still have a really good front kick because nice. um, we did, we did kicks for charity one time and like I was sore for. Was it, was this like a certain number of kicks in a time period? Yeah. How yeah, long was, was like, it? Do you remember what that time I, I, domain I was? I don't recall. I don't recall how long it was. It might have been a half hour. It might have been an hour. Ooh. Yeah, I, I don't recall what it was, but I recall that I was young enough to do it, and then I was sore, <laughs> but <laughs> old know, enough to hurt for a long time old, after. Old enough to hurt for a long time after, and it still is ingrained yeah. in my memory. But I remember we were doing kicks for charity, and. Uh, and that was like extremely painful. <laughs> no kidding, Have you ever yeah. done anything like that? Yeah. Yeah. We, we did, we did some kickathon stuff when I was a kid uh -huh. and 
up through early teens. And, you know, we would do, I think it was two minutes. How many kicks can you do in two minutes? Because two minutes of constant kicking is a lot of kicking. It, it my, you know, my memory is, uh, is vague now. Cause it's like, you know, we're going back a, a couple of, decades now (laughs) so i'm in my 40s this was in my 20s so i don't recall how long it was i just recall it being painful sure and you know it might have only been five minutes of kicking (laughs) still five minutes is a lot of kicking yeah yeah yeah. okay so So, uh i i know you were about to ask me a question what styles did you study uh so i i grew up with a few styles of karate um and i've i've bounced around i've done judo and i've done jujitsu and i've done taekwondo and kickboxing and uh some tai chi in there and i just i love it i think you and i have that in common we we both love to train i you know i consider myself a martial artist not i do karate i do taekwondo i'm I'm a martial artist i it's all good me too yeah we have the same soul so i 100 percent. we have the same hair too yes yes great haircut (laughs) Great haircut. Um, I love Tai Chi and uh, I can't wait to do it. And I still love Kung Fu to this day. And uh, once I retire and have a little bit more time, I will find a Wing Chun school. Mm. And I just cannot wait to hit the wooden dummy, you know, and just practice those techniques. Um, Not because I feel like I'm going to compete with someone, but because like so when i was but because i just love i lo- i still love bruce lee i still love wing chun chi kundo you know yeah, I still how, how love, many how many hours did you spend watching people beat on a wooden dummy at some yeah, point in these movies you were watching yeah, as a kid yeah and i'm like i have to do that someday you know oh. i have to learn how to strike a wooden dummy and i have to i so i've never trained in wing chun or kung fu but I still want to train in, in Wing Chun mm-hmm. and I still want to do Tai Chi. Um, occasionally I'll do yoga. I don't consider yoga martial arts. So I consider it more of an exercise, yeah. stretching type of a thing. But my girl, she really loves yoga and uh, I've done hot yoga a few times. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I'm just, I'm down to try all different types of things, you know, like, uh, I, oh, and the other thing that I have, I, I really, really want to do, so is I, I want to go to Brazil and I want to do capoeira on a beach with Brazilians, you know, nice. like I, I went to the Philippines. I did capoeira there. I, I saw I was passing by a school and it said capoeira. I'm like, oh, I'll go try that. You know, like Filipino capoeira. I'm like, that sounds awesome. <laughs> How was it? And it was incredible. You know, they were, they were playing the drums, they're playing the music, they were doing the warm ups, And I was like, oh man, this had is you, so had much you fun. Had you done any capoeira before that? Only in no. my living room. Okay. Only in my living room. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Only in my living room. So, you know? so much fun. So, so much fun. So much fun, you know? And, uh, and it's, it's, you, you sweat like crazy. It's exercise <laughs> and yeah. it's, it's, it's dancing. It's, it's just fun. Like I would say of, all the martial arts that I've done, capoeira to me is the most fun. I'm just like grinning ear to ear. And like, I, I don't think any other martial art incorporates music like that. You know, not, where, not traditionally, not traditionally that I'm aware of. Yeah. May, maybe you, can, you can't have capoeira without the music. And, and I, right. any traditional capoeira program I'm familiar with, learning how to play the instruments is part of your progress. Yes, yes. yes. And uh, that's one of my weak areas is uh, music. My middle son is a musician and I the just, the athlete, the, the born athlete turned music. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, he's, he's like, he's had a keyboard and he's always been, he's always known how to play it. Hmm. Um, like, I can't remember the song by Dr. Dre, but he could play that same, he could play the same keyboard still dre yes 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 i think so i think so but he can play that piano by ear like he just oh wow he he learned how to do so i'm like man you're a natural natural musician and uh that was another argument it was like he has so much talent for making 
beats and making music. I was like, you could be a music engineer. And he loved it too. And he's like, I don't want to spend my days, uh, you know, doing music. He's like, I just want to do it for me. And I'm like, all right, I respect that, you know, but I'm like, yeah. there's money here that <laughs> you're leaving money on the table. So anyway, I, I digress back to Capoeira and uh, the Philippines. Any, so my plan pre COVID was to put two stamps a year on my passport. Okay. Uh, yeah, I try to travel very inexpensively and uh, yeah. I was, I was like staying at hostels, but uh, at one point when I was in Japan, I was, the hostel in Japan was gorgeous. It was, uh, it was like brand new. Um, but it, I think I stayed in one in the Philippines and I was like, it was all like really young people. I was probably in my later thirties at this point and everybody was in their early twenties. And I was just like, maybe I can afford to upgrade from a hostel. <laughs> <laughs> I know that for like well. a little bit, you know, I was like, yeah. yeah, I don't need to stay in a hostel, but a hostel's really fun. If you're with a group of people, like if you have um, three to four more people with you, yeah. A hostel can be really fun because you can take over the room and the room is just yours. But if you're traveling solo, like I was, I did a few trips solo by myself uh, just because there were places that I wanted to see. Like I, like I always wanted to go to Japan. I saw a mm -hmm. traditional sumo wrestlers oh, um, nice. tra training. Yeah. Yeah. Now, did you that, step in there and mix it up with them? Like you did with, no, yeah, you, <laughs> no, didn't, you didn't no. walk in and be like, I want to learn sumo. No, 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 no. I just, I, uh, some things I'm smart enough to know <laughs> that, uh, I'll just watch as a fan. Yeah. Like, uh, judo is one of those things that I'm smart enough to know. Like I trained with, uh, his, his name was judo Jeff and he was, uh, I would say he was like five, 10, 210 pounds, solid guy, stocky, solid, you know, solid, solid guy. Yeah. And, um, I've always been about 150, pretty much, uh, my entire adult life. Mm -hmm. Uh, not, I'm not, a, you could tell from the pictures, I'm not a big guy. I'm a small guy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, he used to toss me around, but one thing I learned was how to like, not get tossed around as much. Like I would hop with it. So, uh, he would come to our jujitsu school occasionally cause he was friends with my instructor. And uh, he never took it easy on me. <laughs> like he was a black belt in judo, and like, and he never ever took it easy on me. God rest his soul. He he passed, mm. but he was just like he was just like a hard man, and um, like every old set. Oh, he was old school, yeah. and and he never ever took it easy on me. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> like okay. so so like I knew training with him i'm like man i don't want to be thrown all session long um like i love learning ju uh, judo techniques i love 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 the throws a lot of them uh correlated with wrestling and just like traditional jujitsu just like the trips were so artistically beautiful you know mm. the, like i so judo is one of those things like sumo wrestling that I can appreciate as a fan. Every time it's on the Olympics, I, uh, I, I watch the YouTube highlights, you know, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll watch the matches and, and, uh, and even when I, when I was training, if I had a willing partner that was similar in weight to me, I'd be like, Hey, let's just do throws today, you mm -hmm. know? And, uh, so I, I have put in a few hours of judo training, but it's one of those things that I know that I could not sustain physically. <laughs> even, even knowing how to fall, it's just like, it's one of those things that's like, I feel my, this is my own personal belief. No one get mad at me, yeah. but I feel that I feel that judo is a very hard on the body sport. And, um, like, you know, my fingers were always taped up. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're throwing people at the floor constantly. Throw, like that's throwing. the whole, your whole job is to take a person and hit them with the ground. Yeah. That, that yeah. Is and even, and even with the mat, catch up even with you. the mat, you have the, uh, you have the chance of things in your back or your hips mm -hmm. just going a little bit out of whack. Yeah. So I, I've had some, you know, I've had some judo injuries and I was just like, 
yeah, I don't think judo is my thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like I know myself well, so like I can be a fan of it. I'm a huge fan, huge fan of jujitsu, uh, not jujitsu, judo, huge fan of judo. And the reason why I love jujitsu so much is uh, like I consider jujitsu the parent art where like all of these other things like judo branched from mm-hmm. jujitsu, uh, ninjutsu branched from jujitsu, you know, Brazilian jujitsu branched from traditional Japanese jujitsu. Um, but I, and, and even Aikido, I had fun training in Aikido. Mm. Did you do that in Japan? I did not. Okay. I, I didn't have enough time. I didn't have enough time. Like, like I said, I was looking for a traditional jujitsu school. Mm. I was looking for a tr- traditional Japanese jujitsu school. And the part of Tokyo that I was in, I couldn't find one. Mm. You know, like I probably would have to go to a different part of Japan because um, I was in the city and everything around me, like, you know, I did a quick Google search and everything around me was Brazilian jujitsu. <laughs> in Japan? <laughs> in in Japan. Tokyo? In Tokyo, oh, man. I, you know, like I'm sure that's if not I what I would have expected. I'm sure if I linked up with someone who was local, because there's yeah. a lot of hidden, hidden places that totally. aren't necessarily on Google and they have like, they have restaurants on top of restaurants. And then there's like hidden restaurants that like, if you don't know that it's there, Tokyo, if you ever get the opportunity, like I would highly recommend you book a trip this year, if you can swing it financially um this year or next year like save up for that trip Mm -hmm. and as a lover of martial arts plan that trip to go to some martial arts schools and just like it's it's such a it's such a magical place like Mm. like you feel the energy the the vibe of when i was in tokyo i was like man i could totally totally live here it is such a cool place so the culture of Japanese people is um, every there's very little crime and mm-hmm. it everyone's very respectful. When you're on perfect example, when you're on a train, uh, everyone has headphones in. There's no conversation between people. It's a it's a silent ride. Mm-hmm. So everyone's sitting there like this because if you're having if you and I were having a conversation on a train people would give you the side eye because you're being disrespectful to the other passengers. Oh, wow. And, and everyone understands this. So no one is there having a full blown conversation mm, on their cell that phone. That sounds lovely. It is, it is that's, and that's their culture. It is a beautiful, beautiful culture. It's the exact opposite of my experience on the trains in New York. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to experience that. And then, um, so my guide, he told me, you know, like if Americans do that, uh, the Japanese people, they, they realize like they don't give you as much of a side eye because they're like, well, you know, they're a foreigner, they're a tourist, they don't necessarily know. But if a, another Japanese person does it, they really give them a scornful look. Mm. They, they, you know, like you get a scornful look. And uh, at the uh, traffic lights, no one, like there could be no traffic. I'm looking left and right and there's no traffic and no Nobody's one's going. crossing. No yeah. one's crossing. Like, it's just like, they like rules. Very, they like very, process. Yes. A very lawful society. And, um, if you leave your wallet on a table in a restaurant, they'll bring it up to the front and, uh, you don't have to worry about, mm-hmm. you know, money being missing. It depends. You know, obviously there are some bad parts of town, you know, that, uh, every place has its criminals, but for some reason, they have less crime in a larger city than than we do. You know, it's and it comes down to the culture of the people. You know, like it really is a it's a beautiful society. And like when you visit it, you'll understand mm-hmm. what I mean. So um, I saw the cherry blossoms like I had such oh, an amazing, nice. amazing. I saw uh, Mount Fuji. I was at the bottom of Mount Fuji at, at this uh, lake called Diamond Lake because it's shaped like a diamond. You could see the reflection of Mount Fuji in the lake. Mm. And uh, it's like, that was a magical trip. And the only thing that's holding me back from going back again is I have so many other places that I want to see. <laughs> I get it. Uh, now, so, now, I'm, go I'm, ahead. Cu- I'm curious, you know, so 
again, we come back to this arc of you falling in love with martial arts and what it represents before you even have the opportunity to formally train and you go off, you're doing some of these things. And I don't think that as someone who grew up practicing Japanese and Okinawan martial arts, there's a more iconic, real visual that I could have than Mount Fuji. You know, what, what was, what was it like being there and kind of like checking that box? You're like, all right, there's Mount Fuji. Like I'm, I'm here. Like I've done this. Like that's the other thing that I wanted to do there. I just, I ran out of time. There was just so much to see and so much to do. I wanted to go to a traditional, like Okinawan style, mm -hmm. uh, you know, dojo and just do, you know, one, two classes. And, uh, I just, I ran out of time, but that was sure. that. So that was the whole reason why I packed my gate. I packed my gi, and at that time I was a black belt in jujitsu, mm -hmm. but I was not going to pack my black belt. <laughs> <laughs> like I always had this belief, and I don't know how different schools are, but like I would never bring a black belt into an, another school because I feel like I am a white belt entering into that school. So that's, that's uh, nice. when I went to the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu school, I brought my blue belt. <laughs> okay. Because I was like, you know, they'll they won't have a problem with the blue belt. You know, like I wasn't a black belt in jujitsu in, in, in Brazilian jujitsu. So I was like, I, I can safely say I'm a blue belt, you know? Yeah. So, so I brought my blue belt and, um, and I, they, you know, they embraced me with open arms. And I trained there for two hours, but the, I also brought my white belt in my, in my suitcase as well. Yeah. And if I had gone to a traditional karate school, um, I would have brought my white, my white belt, you know? Yeah. So that was my plan. When I went to Japan, I packed my gi with the intention of visiting some schools, but, uh, also eating sushi and, you know, and just in, enjoying the sights. There was just, there's just so much to do. The size of Tokyo is like the size of, um, you know, part of Connecticut all of Manhattan and, and Newark all together. It's wow. a massive, massive city. Like, and people don't realize how big that city is. It is one of the biggest cities, you know, on, on our, on our planet. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. So, so if you, if you do plan a trip and you do go, uh, you we, definitely want to have, you want to have a guide, yeah. someone that can show you different things. Like I, at the time, I, I, I split my time between uh, Tokyo and then another part. I can't even remember where it was. It was a little bit further south. I took a train like an hour and a half there, and I uh, linked up with a buddy who's in the Navy. Did you know that uh, the U.S. has a Navy station in Japan? And we've, they got, have, we've got a bunch of military folks over there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had no idea until I traveled there. And then I linked up with this guy who's in the Navy and he's like, yeah, I'm stationed in Japan. And he's like, we have a contract to defend Japan. Um, first, if there's any, which is kind of funny, like, like we're such allies with Japan now that if, uh, someone attacks them, we, okay. the, and everyone knows the U S is coming to their defense uh first like we're their first line of defense if if you attack japan you're attacking the u.s yeah yeah it's it's heavy stuff geopolitics man yeah 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 so i stayed with him at his place and he he became my guide oh, and cool. uh i had some of the best indian food i've ever had <laughs> in in japan indian food in japan capoeira in in the philippines <laughs> in the philippines yeah All right. yeah 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 so uh, I, I always bring stuff to work out and train. And, and when I trained in Japan, I hadn't rolled with anybody for like 10 years at that mm. point. At that point, I had been retired from the sport for 10 years. And, uh, you know, I was like, it was like a fish out of water. Like, it's just like flood, you know, everything flooded back to me. And I was like, I was still really, really good. Cause you don't lose everything, you know, like it's all muscle memory, mm -hmm. but, um, but my, my cardio wasn't there, you know, my endurance wasn't there, but I just love, I love rolling so much. And then another 10 years went by and, uh, it was father's day. I, I want to say like two years ago 
And my son said, hey, my school's having a Father's Day. So I went to his to his school and like rolled with him for like an hour and a half. And I was like, Hey, just take it easy on me. Cause I'm like, (laughs) cause I'm like, you can break. So now like my youngest son, he's like 170 and he's uh, training to be an MMA fighter. And I do not want him to be a fighter whatsoever, (laughs) but this is, this is a battle that like now I'm old enough and wise enough till I'm like, I'm like, "Ah, let's just let it play out the way he is 21. Okay. And, He's training at Long Island MMA. Um, he got in, he's an ambassador for like a food delivery service. So Mm -hmm. like, so, you know, like he's doing all the right things. He's training jujitsu. He's training MMA. Um, he's training the Muay Thai and the stand up, Mm -hmm. and he's got the wrestling base from being, you know, from being, having a maniac foundation. Yeah. (laughs) No yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the foundation. I always said if I was going to build a perfect fighter, uh, the base would be wrestling. And then at some point they would learn, like I would, if I had unlimited funds, I would send him to Thailand and he would train in Thailand for two years, two years of just nothing but Muay Thai in mm-hmm. Thailand. And then come back and I would send him to like a, uh, like a famous gym in Brooklyn like a famous boxing gym, learn and learn the head movement because like in Muay Thai, there's no head movement. (laughs) You just, you stand there and you bang. (laughs) Did you ever do Muay Thai? Um, I have trained with people who do Muay Thai. I would not say I've done Muay Thai. Yeah. 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 So, so in Muay Thai, in, in general, I'm speaking in general, there's very little, uh, they don't have the traditional boxers head movement, you know, nobody has a traditional boxers head movement. I mean, it's, phenomenal right. you get right especially some of the high level fighters you know because yes. like tyson fury and it's like how yes. how does your neck do that yes 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 tyson fury and uh, floyd mayweather and uh roy jones jr um mm. oh and prince prince hasim muhammad you ever see him any mm. of his highlights no, no I, don't uh, I i don't know how to say his his name correctly it's just off the top of my head but if you if you google he's ultra cocky but his his head movement is just unbelievable the way he can like uh just get out of the way of that punch Mm. like to have those fast twitch muscles like that like i am uh i so in the 80s and 90s i was a huge fan of mike tyson like Mm -hmm. like every like everyone else how could you not be how could you not be uh you know it was like people would get together and that was the premier pay-per-view event where like Mm -hmm. everybody was gathering and it would be over in under five minutes, you know, (laughs) like (laughs) you'd you'd have this big night plan, but there were other fights on the card. Thankfully you had a, you had the undercard. Yeah. You had the undercard and uh, you know, I've like you, I've, I've had a love for all martial arts and I consider wrestling and boxing martial arts and i consider them you know um science they boxing is the sweet science and i i just love i'm still to this day i'm in love with the head movement Mm -hmm. and the shoulder the shoulder movement the head movement and and uh there's a guy um on youtube also that i watched like i've watched the video like a dozen times probably uh how to win a street fight without throwing a punch and uh and he goes up, he gives people these boxing gloves and he puts it and he's like, I'm going to put my hands down and, and sometimes he puts them behind his back mm-hmm. and he's just doing head movement at the end of the video. He's like, I don't recommend you try this. <laughs> <laughs> no, that sounds like a bad idea. He's like, I don't recommend you try this, but he's like, but the principle that I'm showing you is that you can tire your opponent out by making them miss. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it's pretty incredible. Like, all he's doing is uh, rolling, pulling. You know, he's he's rolling with the punches. He's pulling from the punches, and and he's ducking and he's ducking punches. And he's making you know they're not trained fighters, obviously, uh, but he's making them look silly, and they're t- and they're getting tired out. You know, because everyone throws a one two, and it, and they all rush them. They all throw a one two, one two, one two, and they all rush them. A few people were throwing hooks. And trying to throw uppercuts, but they were getting exhausted chasing after him. 
Mm. And um, and I've I've been a fan of that. Like, I uh, I have a friend who owns a boxing gym who's also a cop. He came on with me 25 years ago. He owns a boxing gym, and I would send him the videos. And uh, he's like, yeah, come on down, come and do it. But it's just time, you know, like everything is just time. Absolutely. You know, like you have to evaluate like where do you want to spend your time? And right now I'm building my own podcast. Yeah, I'm building I was just own... about to bring that up. Yeah, that's thank, so thank let's, 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 let's talk it. Let's talk about that. So uh, my podcast, that's my logo in the back there is uh, for first responders and uh, police officers, firemen nurses and other emergency medical personnel it's called the hero academy by david dm like carpe diem d-i-e-m um there is an anime show called my hero academy but i had no idea of that when i created <laughs> my show <laughs> so that anime comes up when you uh when you look it up but um we're into our second season i'm only uh I'm only, you know, I'm still, I haven't gotten to hundreds of episodes yet, you know, um, but I've done dozens now. Yeah. It's just a and, question of time, man. Just keep grinding away. And uh, it's just, I, I call, I call those people uh, our frontline heroes because, um, you know, I feel like they're the unsung heroes of our society and they uh, don't get the recognition that they deserve. And a lot of them have some great, great stories of, totally. uh, and so I focus on their story. Whenever I talk to another uh, cop, it, it's I always ask them, "Hey, have you trained at all?" You know, and yeah. and the the most frustrating thing about cops is they go through the academy. Uh, generally, they get six weeks, eight weeks, maybe of defensive tactics training, and then they never train again a day yeah. in their life. Yep, and something happens like say, say you're a 10 or 11 year street cop and all of a sudden you get that one person who turns around and wants to throw a punch at you and you think that you're going to remember defensive tactics from uh from 10 11 years, ago, years, plus years 11 years yeah. ago where you trained where you trained for eight weeks <laughs> right. you trained for eight weeks you it's know, like saying here's your yellow belt that's all you need so right. yeah Right, right, right. Here's your yellow belt and be on your way. Never train again a day in your life. And um, so when I joined the police department, I knew uh, I was going to train. As long as I was on the street, I was going to train. Mm. So that's why I joined that uh, karate school, the Kempo school. And uh, then I fell in love with jujitsu. And that's mm. why I joined the jujitsu school. And I got to a point where I felt confident enough that um, I'm like, all right, I, I've been, I've rolled with guys that were like 225 pounds. I rolled with a guy who was, who was 190 and shredded mm. and he was a secret service agent Ooh. and he was just a cool guy. Um, I can't remember his first name now, but he was a really cool guy. And, and we trained together. And at the time I was like, I was giving up probably 45 pounds, but um through technique, you know, proper technique, I was holding my own with him because I had more years of experience yeah. than he had, than he had technique, you know, like, so I got to a point where I felt comfortable enough that I'm like, all right, I think I can handle myself, you know, like I, I feel pretty confident in my ability and, and my verbal judo, I left this out. I didn't get a chance to say my verbal judo skills are excellent. Like I can avoid confrontation pretty, pretty well. You know, is that, is that a skill set you've always had? Uh, it's something, it's a term that they taught us. I went to the city Academy and they okay. taught us that term in the city Academy. And then they taught us that term in, uh, my local Academy also. And, uh, I, I feel like I honed that skill, you know, like I would talk people into cuffs, you know, I would say mm. things like, I would say things like, listen, man, there's no reason for us to get into any kind of drama. Like, you know, let's just keep this easy, keep it light, you know, and, and knowing full well, like, like, Hey, if, if it's on, it's on and I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but, you know, I would give, I, I would speak in a command voice, but 
also very relaxed. And, you know, like I, I was the guy that would show up and relax things. Like I never, I, I remember being at a domestic call once a uh, cop in uniform mm-hmm. and this other guy who I, I knew never trained a day in his life goes up to the guy. He's in the guy's house and he's sticking his finger in his chest. So like he's inflaming the situation. Yeah. And, I, I'm, and you, you don't want to, you don't want to call the guy out while you're on the scene, but I'm looking over to my left and I'm like, what the i, I don't want to curse but you're, i'm like well, i'm like escalating what are you doing? For sure. i'm like what are you doing you're escalating the situation yeah. you know so afterwards i i remember i think to myself i'm like all right i'm gonna tell this guy like hey you need to calm down because uh you're escalating situations and i'm like and you're gonna you're gonna force us to get into uh you know roll around a fight with this guy where it doesn't have to be like you know you can you can kind of, you can talk most people into cuffs, you know, like unless, unless they have nothing to lose, but those, even those people, I would say 99% of them, they just want to get away. Mm. They, they're not trying. There's, there's that 1% of the 1% who are like, yeah, I'm going to, if, if I get into it, I'm going to kill you. Like those people are crazy, you know? Um, but there's very few people out there who are like, hey, if a cop ap- approaches me, I'm going to kill that cop. You know, like, <laughs> right. thank, thank God. Fortunately. That fortunately, there's very, very, very few people out there in the world that have that mentality. But on the same hand, you have to be able to defend yourself if you come across that person. Right. Like, if it's just you and him and your backup is five to ten minutes away, can you survive that long? Mm. And I used to tell my uh, my my ex, like we live in a I live in the suburbs, and I used to tell her like I was always training for the scenario of if I chase someone into the woods, and it's just me and him, can I survive for ten minutes until somebody finds out where I am, or can I survive until until I as long as I need to? Yeah. One of the things that they taught us in the academy was uh, when you have a gun on your hip and you get into an engagement with someone there is no losing if you lose you lose your life so you have to have that mindset of i can never lose i'm undefeated and i remember in the city academy uh one of the instructors said uh plan on being punched in the face and i remember thinking no 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 i'm never going to be punched in the face i'm like maybe that's you but i i never got hit by anybody and no one ever even swung on me because like i said my verbal judo skills were on point you know, so right are, are you still active are you still i'm active? still a, I'm, I'm still a detective okay uh, i'm still an active duty detective but i don't uh i don't go out and arrest people anymore like i'll send i'll send a young cop to go do that sure. you know like <laughs> um and, or if i don't send someone to go do it i'll make a phone call and i'll have them surrender with their attorney <laughs> you know it's like like if i I know they have an attorney. It's like, hey, can you arrange for your client to surrender on this date and time? So, like, I'm really not in, in the streets active. Um, That's good. That's I, the difference between, I, it's between a, a young kid and, and an adult. Yeah. Like, you're not even going out grabbing them. You're just calling them up. Hey, yeah. we need you to come in. I'm not even leaving yeah. my desk. Like, it's your yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I have to I have to get up and walk around in order to be active. Otherwise, mm. I could end up sitting at my desk for eight hours a day. Mm and uh let myself get out of shape which would never ever happen uh, <laughs> but you know but it does happen to a lot of other people totally. that i work with because they uh it's a different mindset you're not out walking around uh shaking hands and talking to people and getting out of the car and doing car stops you're you're just sitting literally sitting at your desk uh answering the phone taking messages and calling people and you know like uh the most you do actively is you might go out and look for video for for an incident you know mm. like if uh, somebody used a stolen credit card inside of a inside of a mall you might go but even that can be done with a phone call like you might yeah. call a manager and say hey can you see if you have video for this you know uh you have to you have to decide to be active and i i would say my whole career has been defined by me deciding to be active mm. you know so back to uh the x was I, I would tell her like, Hey, I have to be ready for a scenario where I'm fighting with someone. And she understood that. So, uh, she, she would allow me with little kids to go and train for, you know, two hours a night. I, I used to work midnights 
And uh, I could always be home for the family, but training like six to 8 PM, she knew I had to be, I had to be in the gym, you know? Yep. And I'm, I'm grateful for her for, uh, for allowing me to train and understanding that like, to me, it wasn't like, it wasn't martial arts training was never, especially once I got on the job, it was never like a recreational thing. It was an absolute, I must do this. So that was my mindset. It was like, I must, must train, you know? All right. So remind us again, your show, where do people find it? Tell, yeah, absolutely. Tell us all absolutely. That again. I, yeah, it's the top of the hour. So I'm going to let you go. And I'm going to go to the gym myself. Nice. Um, my website is my name. It's davidleith.com. My, uh, if you want to see my coaching, my coaching website is the uh, Hero Coach Academy dot com, and my podcast is the Hero Academy by David Diem, not David Lee, David Diem. So uh, that's a story for another time. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, that's my that's my got a radio. bunch going on. That's my radio name is David Diem. That's right. also uh, like my my Facebook name. If anybody wants to link up with me, uh, Instagram, it's uh, David Leith one. So uh, definitely uh, look me up, link up with me on Facebook. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll link all this stuff in the show notes for yeah, people making yeah, it easy for them. To yeah. And I'll, I'll send you. you, I'll send you an email with uh, all my contact information oh, too. Please. All right. So as we fade out here, you know, I always invite the guests, you know, wh what are the final words you want to leave for the audience? You know? So the final words that I want to leave for the audience is every sexual assault victim that I talk to nowadays. Uh, I used to be in special victims and I used to deal with kids, but even the kids, uh, if they were old enough, I would tell their parents, hey, put them in jujitsu because it will, it will help bring back their confidence. And, uh, and now if I speak to an adult sexual assault victim, I, I tell them, hey, when you're ready, join a martial arts school. I, I don't say specifically jujitsu, but I just say join a martial arts school and um, you know, it'll help bring back some of that confidence that has been taken from you. And my advice to your audience is, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir because all of your audience, they love martial arts. That's right. <laughs> but if you can tell uh, someone that has kids to put their, ki to put their boys, they, un it's unfortunate they don't have wrestling for girls, but put their boys in wrestling no one on the wrestling team, no matter what their size, what their weight class, no one on the wrestling team ever gets bullied in school. Mm -hmm. That is a hundred percent fact because they have their other teammates and they also have the confidence of knowing what it is to engage in physical combat. It's not, it's not life or death combat, but it's, it's a sport combat yeah. and no one. So, so every time I meet a parent, I always tell them like, listen, the very best advice I can give you, if you have small children, put them in wrestling as soon as humanly possible. And if you can't, if your school doesn't have wrestling available, then put them in jujitsu because, or, or, you know, any other martial art, but mm. you know, obviously I'm, I'm biased towards jujitsu. Um, that's, that's my bias, but put them in a martial art, put them in jujitsu. And my girlfriend actually listened to me um, and she put her kids in MMA. They were doing uh, karate and then they started doing MMA at a different school mm -hmm. and they absolutely, absolutely loved it. Like they took to it, like nice. they, they, they love it. So um, the 10 year old, he's more of a, a book reader and, you know, so it, you know, like he, he has the tendency to possibly get picked on mm -hmm. and he, he took to it like a fish out of war, you know, and he just absolutely loves it. And he gets in the car, he's all, he's all lit up and he's like, David, you got to show me how to like, uh, control a heavier person. He's like, cause I really want to beat my friend DC <laughs> like when, they, <laughs> when they spar. Nice. And, uh, I'm like, all right, no problem. We have to work on your, uh, we have to work on your back control. I'm like, you can do that on, on my back, you know, like I'll, I'll try to like, it's almost like, like, uh, what's it called? Bull riding, you know, like I'll try yeah. to knock, <laughs> knock you off and you just hold on really tight, you know? 
Um, I, I can't say how much, I, if you haven't picked it up by now, how much I love martial arts and, and, you know, like, uh, top of the top of that food chain for me is wrestling and, and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Mm-hmm. But those are, those are my personal loves, but it's not to say that I don't love Kung Fu still as, you know, like the, the kid in me still loves Kung Fu. And, um, I forgot to mention my youngest son was doing Taekwondo for a couple of years. The one that wants to be an MMA fighter was doing Taekwondo, (laughs) you know, so he was doing Taekwondo and he's just like, he has that. I passed on that love of martial arts and, and I watched the matrix with, uh, with my oldest son, (laughs) you know, like one of my all time favorite movies, the matrix. And we, you know, like my oldest son, he was going through, um, a bad time with his girlfriend and he's like, dad, I need to come over. So he came over. He, he doesn't live home anymore. So he came over and we sat down and uh, we watched the newest Matrix together. And uh, it was just like memories like that, you know, like mm. martial arts. Um, they've always been a part of my life and they will continue to be. And I love. Oh, my God, I can't believe I didn't bring up the avatar. The, the concept. Uh, you, do you know who the avatar is, right? Ang? The last yeah. Avatar, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we watched that as a family. Such a good show. And, uh, it was so, it was so good, so good. So any anything martial arts related, it doesn't have it doesn't have to be like serious. It could be, um, it could be you know, kid related, and I just I love it. You know, like uh, the only thing that I couldn't stomach watching with my kids was the, the Power Rangers. That was oh. the only thing. Because <laughs> it was just so cheesy. There, that yeah, and that's, and that's that's the point of it. That There's was the tea. only thing. That was the only thing that I couldn't stomach. But uh, man, Jeremy, I really appreciated this time. Yeah, this, this was fun, it, man. This yeah. interview was fun. And I hope it made it uh, valuable for your listeners. Absolutely. And I hope, you know, I hope it was a good interview. It was. Wasn't that a fun conversation? I continue to be both surprised and not surprised that hundreds of episodes in, we hear different variations on the stories, different desires to start training coupled with different implementations of what's learned during training. And I love what David's doing. I love how it all connects. So thanks for coming on the show, man. Had fun. Talk soon. Listeners. If you want more, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Every episode has a page all to itself with links, photos, a transcript, and sometimes even more. If you're willing to support us in the work that we do, because remember, we didn't charge you for this episode, (laughs) you've got some options. You could leave a review, buy a book on Amazon, help out with the Patreon, or a whole bunch of other things. If you want to bring me to your school for a seminar, I'd love to join you. I'm a pretty good instructor. And there's some stuff that I teach that, frankly, nobody else really seems to teach. Reach out. We'll make it happen. Don't forget the code. Podcast15 sees you 15% on anything at whistlekick.com. And if you know someone we should have on the show, or maybe there's a topic for a Thursday episode we haven't covered, reach out. Let us know. My email is jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media accounts, they're all at whistlekick. Takes us to the end. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.